Welcome to the For Our Customer Showcase interview. Um, this time we've got one with uh, with one of our long-term cu customers called Aubuchon Hardware. And um, we have the delightful pleasure of Jared Brown, uh, who's going to uh, join us uh, as part of this uh, as part of this interview. Just by a quick way of introduction, uh, my name is Mark Garland. I'm the president and CEO of For Our Systems. And uh, we'll be asking uh, Jared some of the questions and to get more of an insight into Aubuchon Hardware and how 4 has been able to work with, with Aubuchon over the years. So, Jared, I just want to welcome you. I appreciate your time and um, just ask you just to quickly introduce yourself and your role and, and some of your experience with, with Aubuchon. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I appreciate uh, inviting me and, and having me join you. Uh, I am the senior analyst for Aubuchon Hardware, uh, primarily responsible for you know, some minor tasks like supply chain management, retail pricing, uh, very similar topics, uh, keeping our shelves stocked, uh, working with uh, some of our outside vendors like 4R. Excellent. Well, I know we're going to spend a little bit of time together just to get more of an insight into Aubuchon. I'm very excited to, to have this opportunity. Again, thank you. And um, if I may, I'm going to just start out with just, can you share with us um, it's kind of uh, what Aubuchon Hardware is to people uh, who are outside of the of the Northeast region. Sure. Uh, so we're a family, or primarily family-owned company. Uh, we operate 104 stores uh, in New England. Uh, we're primarily convenience-based retail. Um, you know, anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 square feet. Uh, have a lot of premium brands, uh, and we primarily exist as the hometown hardware store for a lot of people. Um, that's kind of our bread and butter, and, and that's a, a model we probably will keep for a long time. Excellent. So I know this um, going back to, I, I believe, when I was at like 1908. So give, give us a, an, an update. It's just kind of when did the company start? Sure. Uh, so we were founded, uh, our first store is in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, uh, founded in 1908 by uh, William Obuchon the first. Um, so that really makes us the oldest family owned and operated hardware store in uh, the United States. Um, you know, so we're anywhere from upstate New York all the way to north of Bangor, Maine, all the way to the coast in Cape Cod. Um, so uh, we've now in fourth generation of management. Uh, so um, above my boss is uh, William Obuchon uh, the fourth, uh, and you know, we uh, continue to have many Obuchons actually still in the building. Wow, excellent. Um, you know, as, a, as I'm sure over that history, it's gone through a number of, of you know, significant changes. And I think present day, you know, retail is going through a number of, of I mean, we're living through these significant changes today. But just kind of share with some of those significant changes that have sort of over the history have impacted the company. Um, and, and, and sort of these external changes that have caused the company to respond or internal changes in terms of improving the business? Sure. Uh, so like with a lot of uh, different retail industries, there's been a huge uh, amount of consolidation in the industry. Uh, so, you know, from the 1970s forward, uh, you know, Obishan has acquired locations and kind of put them under the Obishan banner. Uh, sometimes they were independent, sometimes they were uh, previous ACE locations and a handful of, of totally wholesale new locations. Uh, competing with uh, new technologies is, is kind of a big change of pace, uh, but Obishan really accelerated. I mean, we didn't get our first phones allowed in the stores until the 1980s. Uh, they're in very quickly, I think as early as like 1999, we had registered our first online domain uh, with a web presence and an e-commerce solution. Uh, and now, you know, I think as of recent, the biggest change is Obishan used to be in its own wholesale distribution. Uh, we owned and operated a distribution center at Westminster, Massachusetts that took care of the majority of needs for, you know, as many as 150 locations at one time. Uh, pivoting away from that and, and trying to move towards independent distribution has been a gigantic hurdle. Uh, and I think many locations deal with that, you know, dealing with ACE as a wholesaler, dealing with Emory Jensen uh, and similar partners. 
uh, while competing and staying relevant in an age where Amazon is king, uh, you know, that that is a big challenge and continued competition with Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. Uh, everybody is eating a slice of everybody else's pie at this point, and it's ever changing. Uh, yeah. And that becomes a gigantic challenge for any brick and mortar retailer. Yeah, and I guess more so at the moment with everything that's sort of uh we're dealing with, um, and you know, the the the, the movement to the uh, the, the e-commerce channel in a significant way as well. So, um, I, you know, part of your introduction was uh, you know about 104 locations, uh, primarily in sort of the New England area. Could you kind of share with us a little bit more of kind of the number of uh, product SKUs, etc., um, you know, and the channel to market e-commerce, etc. So that'd be interesting if you could just share a little bit more of that detail with us. Sure. Uh, I'll have to refer to my notes on this one because not stuff I keep in the top of my head. Our largest location just clocks in at just under 30,000 uh, SKU combinations. Uh, our smallest location is about 13,000 uh, SKU com uh, SKUs in the building. Um, average location is about 18,000 SKUs. Uh, so that puts us uh, really, but that, that's for one unique building. Uh, throughout the chain, though, we have uh, 82,000 SKU stores stocked in one of our locations at any given point in time. Uh, but if we include what's on currently on our website, that's 140,000. Uh, but then when we open that up to anything that can, is purchasable to us, it's well over 400,000 unique uh, SKUs uh, that are in the building. But what was kind of interesting uh, recently, I take a look. Um, from 2013 to uh, September of 2020, uh, the number of SKUs, unique SKUs in the chain uh, with inventory almost doubled from 44,000 SKUs to 81,000 SKUs. That, that's a significant change uh, over the course of time, uh, especially as we exited distribution, um, we kind of took the, the limits off of how many SKUs we could service. Uh, when we had a fixed envelope of a distribution center and you know 100 plus stores, we could only service between 9,000, 10,000 unique SKUs in that building uh, at scale. Uh, so to be able to take that filter off, take that limit off, really allowed us to explore new opportunities and new product lines. Um, and, and that's really where a lot of that growth comes from, really tailoring each location to its own market. Uh, it's been a huge driver in our success, and it's allowed us to be flexible through COVID, especially. Uh, yeah. That was one of our challenges. Uh, inventory is king. If you have it to sell it, uh, you know you're you're going to provide a better service to that customer than having empty peg holes, you know, you know, um, just because that's what you've always carried. Yeah, and I think one of the things was interesting when you say you moved out of the wholesale distribution business and working with vendors uh, from a you know category perspective availability of products etc and i think you mentioned something along the lines of it opens up a potential 400,000 items that you could make available through different channels whether it be in the physical store or it be online or it be uh so you know it greatly increases your overall product assortment what i'm what would be interesting is if you could share with us you know where of the sort of product assortments that you've seen some of that growth particularly in use mm. etc uh, i would say we've had the busy Biggest explosion in growth come from some seasonal categories, um, power tool accessories, lawn and garden, uh, gardening in general. Uh, that was a huge trend. Lawn maintenance even this year through COVID. Uh, so many people were home. Uh, the need for hose and watering, gardening implements, small scale gardening, uh, and to some extent, even like the marijuana business. Uh, people are doing things that they didn't do in years past. They're taking care and tenderness and they have uh, a, a real need. Uh, canning jars was another uh, gigantic growth category for us this year. All of which you had no idea until you started this year and things <laughs> that were growth areas. Um, and oh, so, yeah. Yeah, and so that kind of leads me into, um, you know, how do you, how have you sort of uh, anticipating demand in those areas? I mean, because it's it changed overnight. So how have you been able to sort of anticipate demand and predict and, 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 and position or pre-position to be able to meet those uh, those increases in, in those, those demand areas? Well, I would say like a lot of uh, retailers this year, there's a lot of putting out fires. Um, 
thankfully we were able to actually just let 4R maintain a good um, bread and butter assortment uh, and watch these trends and these things moving. Uh, we've put out fires and ordered additional canning. We took some initiatives to fine tune 4R in a, in a wide blanket array. Uh, you know, with one change of a dial one week, I think we added somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.1, 1.4 million dollars for the inventory. Uh, because we knew that we had to, and, and we, you know, kind of targeted A and B items uh, to flood our stores and, and kind of spread the peanut butter a little bit. Uh, but, you know, otherwise we, we look for pressing issues and we talk to our customers a lot. You know, one of our okay. biggest feedbacks uh, is from our customers to our managers and our managers are very diligent about feeding that up to the top. Uh, and that was really key this year was that fast and thorough communication. Which then kind of leads me into, if you would be able to share some of those challenges, you know, at the end of the day, the forecast is always wrong. It's by what degree, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, just to how, how sort of what are some of those challenges that you've had to deal with in terms of forecasting demand and some of these new SKUs? Sure. Um, well, I, I can take one good anecdote. Um, even if you can get the, the SKU that's going to have, uh, you know, an explosion in sales identified. Uh, so like a horn and wasp spray and things like that. Uh, you know, we had a hunch that those categories would be hot this year, Jace, just based on heuristics and, and people's memory, you know, when we had a fairly uh, dry season, then suddenly you get a horn and wasp, boom. Uh, but the one of the challenges we had was predicting when that would hit. You know, so we loaded in inventory on a handful of key horn and wasps use, uh, you know, from S.C. Johnson raid products. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, those sales didn't materialize for another five to six weeks. Uh, thankfully, 4R covered our bases on some of those uh, needs before and after. But the, the biggest challenge is not just what uh, or how much. Th those things you can roll the dice on, but the timing is so critical. Uh, I would say we missed the boat uh, potentially loading in some additional canning jars, you know, early in the season. But you know, it's hindsight at this point. Um, we didn't know that that was going to happen in February when we probably needed to pull that trigger. Okay. As much as you want to bench race and kick yourself, uh, you know, you can't go back in time and, and re-secure that product. Somebody else uh, potentially got it. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously that, that leads us kind of you know, present day. Um, obviously, I think the challenges that are facing retail is, is more so um, than we've probably seen in the past, just with the ever-changing, you know, COVID situation, what was an essential business, et cetera. So let's kind of just go back a little bit in history, uh, if we may, you know, um, Aubuchon's been with 4R for a good number of years. So I'd just like to sort of spend a little bit of time now on, you know, what were some of the common issues and challenges uh, that Aubuchon faced? Um, and really, you know, in essence, what, what was the motivation in terms of searching for a you know, an inventory optimization solution uh, at the back of the time. Sure. Um, I think our biggest motivator goes back to exiting distribution and really making that decision to uh, expand and customize our assortments. Um, we had an in-house uh, replenishment solution kind of tied to our point of sale system. Um, and, and that was good when essentially every location had the same products. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd say everybody needs at least two of these items. Everybody needs at least four of these items. And you know, it was very much a, a min, uh, min Q driven replenishment system with, with some variation. Uh, but what drove us, you know, it, we realized that we didn't have, if you're going to put 10 new SKUs in only five stores, uh, we didn't have a good solution for that. We knew that that did two things. One, that added variability because you don't necessarily know what that new product is going to behave like. Uh, and you add it at a small scale. Um, so you're adding lots of new unique SKUs, but you don't really know how they're going to behave. We needed something that was adaptive, that was going to more or less maintain itself. Um, you know, and, and with a very small uh, operational staff, we couldn't just throw manpower at it. You know, in years past, you could kind of brute force these things and uh, have human eyes, uh, you know, maintaining this relatively small, you know, 9,000 SKUs in the DC and, and, you know, managers kind of took care of the rest. And we turned that upside down. Uh, so we, 
we needed someone who was going to reliably maintain these things that we knew were not necessarily our strengths. Okay. So if you if you if you would just share a little bit with us, I know you know Obishan. I mean, I think in every retailer that's looking at it, you know inventory optimization, forecasting, you know solutions. There's always a, an ability to you know try and solve things in house, uh, you know develop internally, you know uh, build out a, you know a team or, or or really you know partner with a company they like for and appreciate obviously you guys selecting us. So if you could just kind of share with us a little bit of um, what did that search entail? Were these? Were you, did you look at other options with regards to you know internally, or, or were you looking from the sure. start, from the start? Uh, I would say we entertained just about every plausible solution we could. Um, do we modify and attempt to maintain you know a point of sale system that's internal? Uh, do we attempt to onboard something entirely new? Uh, do we intend to, you know, just kind of lean on our IT resources and build something from the ground up? I mean, I think I was party to uh, many different conversations there. Uh, many, many opinions in the room uh, throughout that kind of discovery process. Um, I, I think we looked at probably four or five uh, solutions, you know, that were kind of SaaS driven. Uh, we looked at one that was purely software, uh, and then we also had conversations, obviously, with our point of sale people as well. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to be brutally honest here, <laughs> um, and I appreciate I'm on the I'm I'm asking the questions, but uh, what I, you know what was it in 4R that you saw different, or diff, you know the differentiations with 4R in terms of the other solution providers that you that you looked at and. You know, was there something specific that you would call out that helped with that decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and this was, I can remember having this conversation with our CFO, our COO, and, and different ops people uh, on the team. Um, lots of companies have very sexy looking solutions uh, with pretty dashboards and reporting and uh, really fancy algorithms and math. Um, Everybody has something that looks shiny uh, for our offered and said, no, 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 you don't have to run this by yourself. You know, we have a team of people uh, that you'll meet with every week that maintain this and they run the QA and they alert you if there's a problem and, you know, they raise their hand if there are questions. Uh, and, and that's really what set us apart. You know, we, we really wanted something that was um, not just an appliance. We didn't want to just buy a, a plastic white box off the shelf uh, and plug it in. We, we wanted something that some person was going to interact with us and, and tell us, you know, what was working and what wasn't. Uh, I mean, there was a very rigorous uh, uh, schedule of here are the people you'll talk to and at what schedule. That, that was part of the initial offering was um, you know, if there's a person's name next to it, it's not just, you know, a report that spits out once a week. That that was a game changer for our conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so as you kind of go through this process, um, if you would sort of share with us a little bit more of um, you know, some of those challenges that you've previously stated and how, how did how did 4R at the time address some of those challenges and were we able to address them? Oh, sure. Um, I would say you let everybody struggles with highly seasonal products. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody struggles with how do I, how do I take this one bite at a time? Uh, and really what 4R brought to the table was, uh, you know, let's slow this down. Let's attack this one department at a time. So I think we rolled out two departments a week uh, for something like uh, 12 weeks. Uh, it was a fairly long schedule, but you know, we're talking, you know, at the time it was 80,000 unique SKUs. It was, you know, 1.6 or 1.4 million SKU store combinations that we were QAing uh, over that time. Uh, so rather than say, we'll just use fancy math or we'll just use fancy shiny appliances to tackle these things, uh, we hunkered down and uh, deployed, QA'd, and tuned as we went. Uh, that, that really made us feel comfortable as we're uh, onboarding and, and getting the, the initial setup done. Um, that we felt good that what was coming out wasn't just a mystery number from a black box. You know, we, we kind of had some sense of 
why it was getting to where it was getting and felt comfortable with those uh, reorder points. And uh, there was something very reassuring about that process. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we we continue to tackle seasonal together. Uh, We continue having dialogue. And and again, I I can't stress enough uh, how that dialogue, you know, every week, uh, here are my current problems, here's what's working. You know, and there are weeks that everything works just fine and there's there's no tuning, there's just observation to be had. Um, but, you know, that dialogue doesn't stop just because it's a bye week or because things are calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly COVID uh, proved that dialogue is necessary. You know, we went from relatively quiet weeks to uh, the sky's falling. And I'm glad that we had that. <laughs> uh, that time to regularly meet and make sure that all our ducks were in a yeah. row and it was very um it was very rewarding uh, to have that together good so i don't want to put words in your mouth but how easy or difficult was it to, to begin working with 4r well uh i think uh it wasn't grueling uh but there's a lot of work and and i think what we discovered was uh that work was because we had to examine ourselves. You know, the, the hardest thing you can ever do is, uh, I think, introspection. Uh, we had to spend time understanding our own portfolio of items and saying, I didn't know we carried this. What do we do with this? Mm-hmm. Who bought this? You know, were some of the conversations. Uh, you know, you, you really have to take time understanding your own work. Uh, and candidly, I think 4R made it easier rather than harder. Uh, you know, we had a partner in these things, and, and uh, I think it was difficult because it just had never been done really at this scale uh, all at once. Uh, but it was necessary. It was good for the business. And I can remember uh, more than one executive saying, it's probably good that we did this anyways, right? You know, this is this is work that just needs to get done. Yeah. No, that's good. And I appreciate the uh, unsolicited response. Um, so um, you talked a little bit about sort of the the the, the, um, the implementation approach where you you know two categories a week and you rolled that out and began you know that was you know building up to the you know multi-million store skew combinations. But just curious, how long did that overall implementation take to implement the uh, the solution? Yeah, I had to dig through my uh, my emails to find this one, but we had our kickoff and discovery meeting June of 2016. Okay. Uh, January, we started of uh, 17, we started uh, getting the preliminary QA started. Uh, and then we had all departments onboarded by March. Uh, so really, I mean, we we do things relatively slow because we're fairly methodical. Um, but, you know, to, to really say, I think I want to do this to let's start doing this to, well, guys, we're, we got everything turned on, uh, you know, in, in really a fairly short amount of time. Um, I mean, that, and that's that's to say that we were starting to be f- semi-functional, you know, in January, February of 2017. Uh, that's a pretty quick turnaround for a company of the size, and, mm. you know. Uh, that was seems like forever ago, and it went fast. Yeah, that. yeah. No, it's interesting. It's uh, you know, one more thing we 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 pride on on sort of uh, on a number of things, but one is you know that rapid implementation. But at the end of the day, you can have a rapid implementation, but it's all about you know the results, the the ROI. And what I'd like mm-hmm. if you could share with us a little bit more of of how quickly did you begin to see some of those results? Uh, you know, once the solution was in place. Sure, I think um, it, it was fascinating. We certainly saw results. Um, you know, maybe not week one, but within like two weeks of rollout, we would start seeing some. Um, moderate sales increases, but what was really astounding when we uh, took a pause, I think it was June or July after that last implementation, kind of looking backwards, uh, we were able to see that we actually added inventory and increased turn, which is really, really phenomenal when you think about that. Everybody at the time, we were concerned with how can we reduce excess inventory? How can we maintain our catalog and keep things performing? When right in our backyard, we had plumbing and electrical department items that, you know, needed an additional one or two units per hook uh, that suddenly started selling faster. You know, that that was a really, that was a confounding moment. It really took us time to digest that. That's a really big deal from anybody who really 
considers and thinks about their their end retailers, not just their supply chain. Um, and you know, in a short, relatively short amount of time, you know, less than a fiscal year, uh, we had trimmed you know over a million dollars for the excess inventory. We felt comfortable. Uh, we didn't suffer lost sales, and and we cleaned out a lot of junk inventory just by not reordering that extra one piece just because we sold one piece kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a that was a fundamental change to how we uh, practice buying and selling inventory, truthfully. If you would, could you share a little bit around kind of inventory turnover? If I recall back in uh, back in, in the beginning around was it 2014? I think it was around about 1.5, 1.51 sort of returns. Could you share with us how that's progressed and where maybe you are today? Sure. Um, when we look back kind of through our stock ledger, 1.5 is kind of the benchmark for many years. Uh, we onboarded um, 20, by the end of 2017, we were at 1.78. Uh, and end of 2019, we were 2.13, which was really a gigantic jump. Uh, and obviously, with the the big push of COVID, uh, we actually ended up at 2.52 at the end of September. Excellent. Uh, well, really astounding changes, you know. For you know, yeah, we, we've got sales history on claw hammers for 100 years, uh, and to really move the needle just after onboarding four R is a big deal. Yeah, no, that's appreciated, and thank you for sharing that with us. And um, so, I guess you know, um, on sort of today, uh, let's move to. Well, maybe it's present day, but um, but you know, in your opinion, you know, you work with us very, very intimately with the team, um, as well as uh, myself, and obviously uh, we're working with um, you know with your executive management team as well. You know, what's your favorite part about working with 4R today? Uh, it comes down to people. Uh, people has been the trend from the beginning. Um, I get along with everybody on the 4R team. I look forward to those calls and touching base. Um, it's a genuine highlight to the week because I, I know that it's coming. Every once in a while they get rescheduled, but uh, that that's kind of an anchor in my week, so to speak. I, I know that by the time I get to my Thursday morning meeting, uh, I'll, I'll have a good sense of where the next week is headed. I'll have a good sense and feel good about uh, the changes we're making, and, and especially through COVID when Uh, I mean, every day was a fire drill for months. Um, That was a good grounding point. Hey, here are are the things that are working well. Here are the things that uh, we should work on. Uh, It was a good recentering and focusing on product. Because at the end of the day, we we are retailers. Uh, We make a living selling products. That was a good reminder. Um, Excellent. So... On the home stretch now, a couple of last sort of concluding questions a little bit in terms of, obviously, we all started out 2020. It was a new decade and uh, <laughs> COVID happened us and we're still dealing with it. We're still trying to figure out navigating retail has, has changed in ways that, well, a lot of industries have changed. Uh, certain sections of retail has changed beyond belief. Um, what I would like if you could share with us, um, as you've and you've alluded to some of these as we've kind of gone through this, but what are some of the challenges that are facing you today in 2020, um, and sort of how have you handled some of those some of those um, challenges, um, if you would? Sure, I I think um, sourcing product is our single biggest challenge right now. Um, who has it? How can I get my hands on it? Um, we have many manufacturer relationships uh, from our days of running and distribution, as well as just a really strong uh, team that you know outreaches and interfaces with them. And uh, the biggest challenge is fielding these calls of, I'm, I'm really sorry I'm not shipping. Uh, I'm really sorry my fill rate is low. Um, and, and at the end of the day, apologies are, are tough. They can feel empty at times after they get repeated so much. It doesn't really mean that that person uh, isn't sorry, but you know, by your 12th phone call that week uh, on product that isn't going to show up, uh, it's very disheartening. Um, and, and really the big challenge is trying to lift your head up to the horizon a little bit and say, okay, I can't get my favorite red bucket. Is there somebody else making a bucket? I don't care if it's blue. I don't care if it's little. 
uh, I don't care what it is, but uh, how can I get these things for my customers? Uh, you know, because we are we are parts of those communities we really feel for and, and want to keep putting product on the shelf because obviously they need it, they want it, uh, and, and we would like to do a good job getting that for them. But that's been a really that's been an uphill challenge uh, all year. And so, um, not that 4R is in, you know, part of just everybody's interest. We're not specifically into product sourcing. That's not what we do for, for all, but Sean, but I'm just curious when you're in a product sorted situation, could you share with a little bit of how 4R has been able to help, you know? Oh, sure. Straight inventory perspective and where do you allocate that, et cetera, would be, would be interesting. Well, I, I would say one of the things that's been really a, um, I don't know what the, the nice word for crutches, but something we've been able to rely on for our for is um, instead of just placing a one time order, uh, I know that I can go to the for our team and say, here's a pool of categories uh, or SKUs or, or the particular manufacturers, uh, and we need to raise the inventory level. Might not show up today, uh, but I can be guaranteed with how my ordering system is. It's going to attempt and look for and hunt for that item and, and place an order every week uh, so that when that product is available, it does show up. Uh, a great example, I was on the phone with uh, a manager in one of our stores up in Lindenville, um, and he was thanking me because he thought I did something because two pallets of court mason jars showed up. And, and while it's probably a little bit niche, uh, they're worth their weight in gold at the moment. <laughs> uh, so he was he was thrilled. It, it's a silly thing. In any other year, we wouldn't be talking about these things. I said, nope, it, it wasn't me. You know, we, we just had an order in the system ready to go for it. You know, when that product became available. Uh, so that's been uh, really helpful. For our is persistent. For our doesn't stop. It, you know, it's just one big locomotive trying to search for and hunt for these. Uh, uh, this inventory because it it knows that it should be on the shelf. It knows that that product should be placed in that store. Um, so it just keeps running. Yep, and there's demand for it. Who do know? Who yeah, known that you know, Mason jars would have been the top number. One, well, not necessarily the top uh, seller, but there's a significant demand for it. Move from a C item to an A item. All on the yeah, I, a few months. I'll use this as an opportunity. You know, as an open call, if somebody has mason jars, you know, we're we're buying right now. I mean, it's just a wild market, yeah. wild market. Let me talk to our product people and see if we can move into that direction. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I just want to just send one last question with you. Let's just put history behind us. Today's today. Where do you see kind of 2021? What's what do you see from a retail perspective being? Uh, being some of those opportunities that are out there uh, going into next year and sure we all look ahead we all look forward yeah so I, i've been taking quite a bit of time to try to not think about the the crumbling infrastructure around me and kind of get my eyes to the horizon um the silver lining i believe for 2021 and beyond is um right wrong or indifferent covid has irreversibly changed how people spend their time uh, and I would say wholesale, most people are spending more time with their families or in their homes or in their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and they're, they're spending more time outside. They're spending more time doing these things. So I think the future, uh, you know, some of these growth categories, it's going to be recreation. It's going to be uh, home improvement, you know, making that space that they just spent quarantining for 60 days in. Uh, look a little brighter. They're going to spend some time uh, getting outside because they just spent 60 days inside quarantine, you know. Uh, so we're we're spending quite a bit of effort, you know, trying to support our communities and the people that shop in them. Um, might be snowshoeing, might be sledding. Uh, we're certainly helping. Uh, we do a lot of paint business, mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, people are going to be spending more time with their communities, with their families, and. Um, it's going to be up to us to support them and, and let them do that when whatever they need. Uh, we're, we want to be here for them when they're ready to do that. Excellent. Well, first of all, um, that concludes sort of the, uh, the, the questions that uh, we wanted to get some insights with you, Jared. I just want to take this opportunity to you know, personally thank you and thank you from, you know, from for us perspective to share well, I guess it's uh, 1908, so uh, just over 100 years of, of history with us. Um, a little bit of history around how 4R has been able to 
help Bob and Sean and, um, you know, and, and navigate through these challenging times. And we appreciate that. We've appreciated your continuous partnership and we look forward to a, uh, a, a, a new year in 2021 working with you and um, and just again, I really appreciate you spending the time with us. So I'd just like to uh, conclude the showcase interview and um, thank you for your time, Jared. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you.